one. All right, hello and welcome again to our Encounter Bible Study. This is going to be the study for December 27th, so I'm sure everybody has had a great Christmas, and I'm happy to have uh, Pastor Logan uh, Dixon from the Mars Hill Cumberland Presbyterian Church and Re Reverend Rebecca Zardi from the Madisonville First Church and also from the Rose Creek uh, Cumberland Presbyterian Church. And, um, I wanted to uh, endorse again or promote as much as I can T.J. Malinowski's Cumberland Road. Uh, remember that, uh, well, if you're listening to the Cumberland Road, then you know more about Nate or more about um, Logan today than you did the last time we met because he was the guest. Uh, My apologies. Past, yeah. <laughs> this past Tuesday, he was the guest. And then uh, coming up next is, uh, let's see here, Laura Reed. She's in the program of alternate studies and she's from Tampa, Florida. And so she'll be sitting down with Reverend TJ uh, for the next edition of the Cumberland Road. You can get that on Google Podcast, Apple Podcast. You can find it on Transistor FM. Uh, but look for that and learn more about our uh, fellow Cumberland Presbyterian uh, journey people, journeymen and women. So, all right. Um, I think what I'm going to do is uh, just um, go into this and we'll start with the prayer for elimin illumination not elimination that would be tough <laughs> so again this is for december 27th uh it's going to be luke chapter 2 we've entitled it the salvation of israel and our prayer for illumination is oh god whose son jesus is the good shepherd of our people grant that when we hear his voice we may know him who calls each of us by name and follow where he leads who with you and the holy spirit lives and reigns one god forever and ever amen and our memory verse for this week comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 34 through 35. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. All right. Before we jump into it, I'm going to let Logan, as the writer of this lesson, uh, what's your what was what what's your hopes after somebody sits down and reads this? What what's your hope? Well, um, a few things. I I really want people to look at the text and consider um, why it is Mary and Joseph took Jesus, the the very Son of God, why they took him into the temple to be circumcised, and why they took him there to. Uh, kind of bring him before the temple and have, have him affirmed as a, a Jew. Um, you know, I want them to consider what Simeon means by this prophecy. I want them to think about Anna, the prophetess, and what what she means with her words. And I, I really want people to think about the implications of these things in the context of Jesus's life and ministry. What does it mean that Jesus will be a sign that will be opposed? What does it mean that uh, a, seer, a sword is going to pierce Mary's heart? You know, all of these things is, are looking forward to the events that follow in the gospel of Luke. And so I, I want people to kind of see this as, as a big foreshadowing of the things to come. Mm. Yeah, and that's good. Uh, as we're following the narrative lectionary, you can see <clears throat> all these little signposts to what's coming and, and how to think about things and so on. So good stuff there. All right. I think then, uh, Reverend Becky, I think you were one, like one thing that caught you in this introduction was the, uh, was the discussion question. So yeah, um, it, I'll let you talk it started about off, started off really strong with this great thought about wrestling with God. Um, and that's kind of a theme that you seem to really use throughout this whole lesson, which I think is great. So you ask us, when have you wrestled with God and what was it about? And I think that's a great question because we often wrestle with God, even as pastors, we wrestle with God um, over certain aspects of the text and the way we're learning, or maybe God's calling us to do something and we don't often talk about that. And it's really important for us to talk about it because a lot of our people in our congregations, people that are listening to this today, there's probably something that they're wrestling with. Um, and if we don't talk about it, then we can't move past it or learn from it and, and, 
and really enrich each other with that wrestling. Uh, I know for me personally, my call and women being in ministry was a huge wrestle for me to uh, get over and move beyond to be able to accept my call into the ministry. So uh, that was a great question that you started with and a theme that you kept with through the whole, the whole lesson. And right. I, and for those of you who are listening, you can hear more about her wrestling with that call on my podcast, the Monday morning megaphone, um, <laughs> where I had Reverend Becky Zardi as Plugs. a guest. Shameless plug, but it's good. Shameless plug. <laughs> Logan, one thing I really like, like in the introduction, I'd never read this in detours, uh, but in Becky, the way you're describing it, I think we're, some of wrestling with God is learning to trust God. So like this image of a squirrel, yes. you can't just rescue a squirrel. You can't rescue an animal that doesn't know that you have good intentions. For them. They don't know right. that unless there's some. And so I, I, I feel like that's how I wrestle with God. I mean, I wish I had this greater trust to where I don't know how to explain it, except to say sometimes I'm like a squirrel and like, <laughs> you feel like a squirrel, me. you're a squirrel, <laughs> like a squirrel all the time. But it is a sense in which you have to have a deep connection with the person that's going to rescue you. Yeah. Right. Or you, you don't know if Absolutely. that person's going to do you more harm or, but there gets a point in a relationship to where something greater than you and something that you can trust some, some way in which you can get, you can see your way out of something, I guess. Um, well, I think yes. every, I think every single person wrestles with God on some level. And yes. that wrestling with God is going to end in one of two ways. It's going to end with you acknowledging that God knows what he's doing. And so you're going to trust him on this journey, or it's going to end with you still fighting against God and eventually coming under judgment because of that. Now, which is to say, which is not to say that, which is not to say that uh, Christians who, uh, which is not to say that Christians don't experience uh, it's wrestling because as you said, Becky, we wrestle in our calls. We, we all wrestle with God and on different levels and in different ways. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so my wrestling is not going to look like the same kind of wrestling that someone who is not a believer. Right. Wrestles. That's important. Yes. True. True. And, and even in our own individual journeys, my wrestling is not going to look like your wrestling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So there's lots of different ways you could take that, and there's lots of different ways you could talk about that. I think I will I will highlight that and say that's ultimately what probably what uh, what you just highlighted is what Simeon was trying to say when we talk about the rise and fall. There will the whole life of Jesus. There is a wrestling. Some responded in certain ways, yes. some didn't, and that's that wrestling with salvation or condemnation or whatnot, judgment. Uh, and it is a different wrestling when believers wrestle. Like it's not, mm -hmm. it's not as though we're wrestling about the same thing. Once you're in a relationship with God, you do wrestle a little bit, but it's not that condemnation or fear of judgment. So mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. well, that's, that's good. Uh, did you want to throw in anything else so far as the introductions, the introduction to the lesson? It is a good discussion question. So I hope yeah. uh, we receive a lot of um, good feedback on that lesson for that discussion question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If not, I will go in and ask about the exploring the scripture section. And uh, well, uh, be well, before we get to that, um, I just dropped my book. Well, before we get to that, um, under the introduction, um, I do want to mention okay. Anna, Anna's father. Yes, sorry about that. Yeah, I, I, that's something we talked about. Yeah, um, the passage mentions Anna's father, uh, Fenuel. And it's very interesting because as you're reading the text, uh, the text talks about two people who Jesus' parents encounter in the temple. It talks about um, Simeon, mm -hmm. uh, and it talks about Anna, who is a prophetess. And it mentions Anna's, Anna is the daughter of Phanuel, the tribe of Asher, which is really interesting because the passage does not talk about Simeon's father. And of course, Luke is writing his gospel on valuable parchment with valuable ink, and he just seemingly out of nowhere mentions who Anna's father is. Like, we're supposed to know who he is, or at the very least, we're supposed to acknowledge his existence and think about him. Now, 
you know, as, as we read the Bible, we often look over things like that. We often pass over little details, Uh but I think here it's helpful to think about why Luke would mention Anna's father. And as we study, if, if we, if we study a little bit, we'll find that the name Phenuel is connected to the, as is connected to the word penile, which you will find, um, in back in Genesis 32, where Jacob is wrestling with the with the angel, and after he gets done, it's the break, it's the break of day, and he finally realizes, oh, I've been wrestling with God this whole time, uh-huh. and because I've wrestled with God, I'm going to call this place Peniel. And uh, so I'm going to read this this last section in the introduction. Anna probably called her father the Hebrew equivalent of daddy, but every time she heard someone else say her father's name, she would have remembered the story. Jacob wrestled with God and begged God to bless him. God changed Jacob's name and pulled his hip out of socket as a battle scar to remind him of that night as if his new name wasn't enough. My point is that Anna is probably in the temple night and day having a wrestling match of her own, begging God for the blessing of the Messiah, begging God for the blessing of deliverance from the Roman Empire, begging God for absolution to the struggle of being faithful in the midst of a nation which was losing its Hebrew identity because of a, because a pagan nation sat in authority over it. Yeah, that's good stuff. Sorry, I tried to move on too quick because that's... Oh, no, it's okay. It's just I remember, I remember us, us talking about that before we started yeah. recording. Yeah. No, that's good stuff, and I'm glad you brought it up because I think this whole, this whole lesson is about that struggle. It's about that. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And on the offshoot, my favorite uh, hymn is uh, Nearer My God to Thee, which is good. It's good stuff. Anyway, um, so the exploring the scripture part, you dive in, Logan, into Exodus 12. Um, and so I'm going to let you make that connection for us. And then I know me and Becky both uh, have some stuff to talk about mm-hmm. there, too. Well, you know, as you're going through the lesson and looking at the text and looking at Jesus's parents bringing him into the temple to be consecrated, Exodus 12, if you know the story of Exodus 12, might seem odd um, if you're not thinking about it. But honestly, this is one of the first places in Scripture. Uh, it's, it's not probably not the first, but it's one of the first places in Scripture where we see male children being consecrated in some way, shape, or form. Uh, the practice of consecrating the firstborn male goes back, uh, or the family goes back to the book of Exodus, and we start in Exodus 12. Uh, to get the full picture of why this consecration is is so important. And basically what it is, is Moses is trying to get his people out of Israel, and God finally provides a way to do that. And God sends these plagues, and he says, all right, Moses, I'm going to slay the firstborn of every family in Egypt. Mm-hmm. And in order to avoid in order to avoid the firstborn of your of your child being slain, you have to kill a lamb, and you have to put its blood on the doorposts of your homes. And um, God told Moses that in order for the Israelites to avoid losing the lives of their firstborn, they, they have to slaughter this lamb. And then we read this passage in Exodus 12, uh, 29 and 30. At, at midnight, the Lord struck down all the first offspring in the land of Egypt, from the oldest child of Pharaoh sitting on his throne to the oldest child of the prisoner in jail, and all the firstborn of the animals. And when Pharaoh, all his officials, and all the Egyptians got up that night, a terrible cry of agony rang out across Egypt because every house had someone in it who had died. It's uh, Reading that passage sends chills up my spine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it it looks like destruction. It looks like chaos. It is heart-wrenching. Um, and we, we often have, we often face the temptation to read a story like that and say, God, why did you do this? Mm-hmm. Why are you, why are you causing where, you know, these, we, and, and our automatic assumption is, oh, these people are innocent. Mm. Lord, why, you know, and, and we do that with, with disasters all the time, you know, Hurricane Katrina happens, you know. Um, a tornado rips through a small town in Arkansas. You know, God, where were you? You know, these mm-hmm. people are innocent, and we we try to we try to apply our own standards of justice to God, and it doesn't mm-hmm. work. 
right. does not. So that's where I, I was thinking about any type of these formation or these rituals uh, and things like what happened in Exodus. It is a sense where by doing or remembering what God has done. So by consecrating our, our children or by remembering the acts of God, that is the way in which God tries to form how we think or to teach us maybe a little bit of what God is thinking. So outside of a relationship with a loving God, you would automatically say, God, how could you be so evil? But once you're in a relationship with God and you begin to try to understand and submit yourself to God's ways, you begin to understand a little bit more about these types of mm-hmm. stories and situations. Right. Well, I, the, and the, here's a really good yeah. example. If y'all are, I don't know, I'm sure Logan, you are, but now this guy's getting kind of past his age, but uh, Christopher Hitchens uh, is one. Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins. One of their greatest lines always has to do with the murderous God that wanted Abraham to kill Isaac. How could anybody believe in a God mm-hmm. who would who would command Abraham to kill his only son, Isaac? You know, but first of all, he didn't. But second of all, what happened to God's son? And so in some mm-hmm. sense, from the very beginning, we're trained to think about love, sacrifice, and, and all this jazz through these rituals. And so right. rituals are, are supposed to be formative in our minds, hearts, and in our relationship with God. Right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the when, when God told Moses to tell the people to slaughter that lamb and put the blood over the doorpost, that was a that was a sign that if they did that, God would protect their firstborn. Mm-hmm. And so there's there's always something about children in the Bible that God wants to, God wants to protect children. God wants to uh, mm-hmm. God provides a way to protect children, and He commands us to love children and and disciple children and and raise them up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Mm-hmm. And so all throughout the Scriptures, we see these commands regarding children, and and in doing that. God is showing us that he values the next generation. Mm -hmm. And so whenever we see a story like this, you know, why did, why did all these children die? Why did the, why did the firstborn children of of the household of Egypt die? They died because they disobeyed the word of God. Mm -hmm. God said, you know, I was, uh, death is coming. Hell is moving. You have to protect your children. This is how Mm -hmm. you do it. And if you don't do it, this is what's going to happen. And that's what happened. Yeah. And it was that act of obedience. I mean, you, you hit on that. It was the, the obedience of slaughtering the lamb and, and painting it. I mean, because why does that make sense? To kill the lamb and paint your doorpost, your doorway? I mean, why? But it was that act of obedience that that showed their dedication to their god and and that they would follow him in his commands that that's another path that continues through if you're obedient and you follow what i'm asking you to do you're going to be blessed and if you're not obedient you know there's going to be some repercussions because you choose to be disobedient right Um, another great line that you put in there um that i loved was that no one was exempt from this decree from god but at the same time no one was forgotten either and i I love that line that you also threw threw in there with that because that goes right along with the obedience then as well as the obedience today and the consecration of our families and our homes and what we do no one's exempt from the wrath of god but no one is forgotten either yeah i think and that's these kinds of events it depends on which side of the fence you're on whether this was an act of grace or if this was an act of wickedness right so in that sense Mm -hmm. i mean if you're an egyptian obviously you're going to say this bloodthirsty god if you're a hebrew who's who's not that long ago the pharaoh had their first male children thrown into the river or killed this was an act of absolute justice and mercy of god and right. so I think, again, that foreshadows the Song of Simeon, which we'll get to yep. uh, here fairly soon. Um, anything else we need to hit on on that exploring the scripture section? 
Now, just one more thing you brought up that the Egyptians, uh, it, if you go back to the beginning of Exodus, uh, the Egyptians murdered the, the male children of the Israelites. And so whenever destruction like this comes on the nation of Egypt, um, or, wh or whenever we read another place in Scripture where God commanded the Israelites to go and slaughter an entire town, um, we read that and we think, oh, well, God is cruel. No, these nations are cruel, and God it, knows they're not going to repent, and so this is what needs to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, like I said, it depends on if you're in a relationship with God, you view things certain ways. If you're not, you view things certain ways. Uh, Absolutely. Which I think leads us into directly into the digging deeper section. So we start with uh, Simeon's song, right? Um, mm -hmm. Verse 34 and 35. Let me, that's our memory verse. So let me read it again. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, The child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. So, Logan, I'm actually going to let you introduce us because you brought up these four points that uh, verse 35 and 30, 34 and 35 had. So you can set us up for that one. Yeah. So as you just look at the text and really outline everything that gets said there, you'll come up with, with four conclusions, four statements that Simeon makes. And it almost sounds ominous. He says that this child, referring to Jesus, will he is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel. The next thing is that he will be a sign that will be opposed. The third thing is that the inner thoughts and hearts of many will be revealed. And the fourth thing, fourth thing is that a sword will, will pierce Mary's heart. And if, you know, if, you're, if you are the mother of Jesus, if you're the father of Jesus, and this dude comes running up to you in the temple, and he's excited, but then he says these four things, it's going to sound crazy. But... Then yeah. you know we it doesn't sound crazy to us because we know that we know the story, but you you have to imagine how Joseph and Mary might have felt. Yeah, and so as you look throughout the story of Jesus's life and ministry, you see that these things happen. This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many. Well, who fell as a result of Jesus? I would argue that the destruction of Jerusalem happened as a result of the Jews rejecting Jesus, and the, and the rising of the church occurred out of Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, the next thing, he will be a sign that will be opposed. Well, guess what? Many people oppose Jesus. You can read in, on in Luke chapter 4, Jesus is teaching in his hometown of Nazareth. They opposed and rejected his teaching. The inner right. thoughts and hearts, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to jump in on that. So, like, it goes along with what we were saying in the sense of when people reject Christ, it is not as though, at least from God's perspective or a biblical perspective, that they're rejecting the teaching of Christ. Biblically speaking, when you, and what Simeon, I think, was trying to say is when you reject Christ, you're rejecting God. You're rejecting the mm -hmm. created order. You're rejecting the redemption which God has laid out. And so, in that sense, Christ is more than a human being. He is right. the sign of, uh, of, of God opening up uh, his arms and, and asking people to follow. I mean, so it's, that's the way in Christ is a sign that God is toward you. But if you reject it, that kind of thing, like uh, you're, you, um, you're opposing not just a, a person, you're, you're opposing the created order of God. So, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, you, you mentioned last week, John 14, you know, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so by, by rejecting Jesus, by rejecting what he says, they are rejecting the Father. They are rejecting the very God yeah. who created them and opened his arms towards them. You know, and, and number three, uh, Simeon says the inner thoughts and hearts of many will be revealed. Well, if you go into John's gospel and read there at the very end of John chapter two, it said that Jesus knew what was in the hearts of man. And then number four, yeah. a sword will pierce her own soul as well. You know, Mary was very much aggrieved whenever she had to watch her son die on the cross mm -hmm. at the hands of the mm -hmm. at the hands of the Roman army. And so, mm -hmm. you know, you see all of these things fulfilled in the life of Jesus. Um, two things I'll throw out there. The inner thoughts and hearts of many will be revealed, especially in the book of John, but all throughout the gospel. You Christ. Sometimes you think, well, how do you know if you're saved or not saved? The, the easiest way is to say, you know, by your fruit. Ultimately, your inner thoughts of your heart, it's revealed how you act, what you say, what you do. And so Jesus will bring out that fruit. If you're bearing Jesus' fruit, 
you know you're yeah. in a relationship with God. If you're not, yeah. then you're not. And then the other thing I, I don't want to pass up, we haven't really talked about it just yet, but this the sword will pierce her soul as well, harkens back to the garden where God puts enmity between you and the woman, speaking of the snake, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, you will, you will strike, um, she will, he will crush your head. The offspring of, of this woman will crush the serpent's head, but the serpent mm -hmm. will kind of strike the heel. This is, this is kind of the foreshadowing of that as well, that uh, mm -hmm. ultimately Christ wins, but the piercing of his side, the piercing of Mary, Mary's soul as well. This is mm -hmm. that battle between the woman and the snake, right? So, right. It, so it harkens mm -hmm. back to the beginning. Yeah. And you could also, you, you could see a, a very symbolic picture of that in the book of Revelation and Revelation chapter 12. Mm -hmm. uh, you see that story being repeated all throughout scripture. Yes. So mm -hmm. teachers, if you want to dig deeper into that, you could look at Revelation 12. There we go. I'm going to add that on the list. Um, all right. Yeah, that's a really good section. Becky, have you got? Uh, Man, that was that was an excellent, excellent discussion. Um, and, and I just kept thinking about practical application of that because all of that is is in our own lives every day. Um, because as we walk with God. And as we grow closer to him, our inner thoughts <laughs> are revealed through Christ. And, and it does pierce our own soul when we recognize that we are in opposition to who he is and how he's working in our life. Um, you know, that does pierce us individually as a person. So it's a foreshadowing of what's going to happen in the gospel, but then really a foreshadowing of what happens in each individual person as we continue to walk with God. And you say in this, you know, that those who rise are those who are humble enough to admit that they need Jesus because they can't save themselves. And I think that is so key because especially in the Western culture, we are very much about me, myself, and I, um, and that we can do everything on our own and, and we can't. You know, that's one thing that we need to recognize through this is that without Christ, we are lost, period. End of story. Amen. Right. Um, as I was reading back through the lesson before we started recording, I, I came across that very line you just mentioned. Um, and it reminded me of a, of a sermon that I preached. If I can find it, I'll link it to Chris and he can put it in the resources. But I preached a sermon one time uh, called No Kingdom for Cowards. And I, I use the text in Revelation where all these kinds of people are going into the lake of fire, the idolaters, the adulterers. Mm. And whenever you read that list, there's one, there's one thing in there that really stood out to me in that, at that time. And it was, it was that cowards, it was mm. the text actually uses the word cowards. And so I'm thinking to myself as I'm, as I'm reading this passage, why are cowards thrown in with idolaters and adulterers and all of these things. And it's because, uh, I think to me, and I could I could completely miss the boat here, but to, but I to me, whenever the text talks about cowards, it's those people who put up a false put up a false facade and and believe that they can stand on their own two feet. Yeah. And real bravery is admitting that you can't save yourself. Real bravery Amen. is admitting that you need armor from someone who can give you armor. You mm -hmm. need grace, you need righteousness, and you can't find those things in yourself. Real bravery is admitting that you need Jesus. Mm -hmm. I think that harkens back to the pineal, right? The, mm -hmm. yeah. the, the dislocated the wrestling. You cannot stand on your own, right? You cannot. And so I think, Becky, you did bring this up. Like when, so after reading Simeon's song and, and saying that Jesus is a sign to be opposed and, and all this good stuff, what, the discussion question, is what does it look like to repent? To repent, yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, and that really kind of goes back into the whole wrestling with God theme, the whole understanding that we cannot do this on our own. It all brings us back to repentance. Um, and you reference Romans 12, 1 and 2, and then, of course, our awesome confession of faith, um, which, is, which is amazing on, you know, and you ask, is repentance a one-time thing? 
let me say I like that you connected Romans 12, 1 to 2 to repentance. Not everybody does that, but that's that's what repentance is. It is the giving up of your own thoughts, the worldly thoughts, whatever, and then being yeah. transformed by the renewal of your mind. That's good. Yeah. yeah, almost every time you see the word repentance or the word repent in, in the New Testament, the Greek word for it is metanoia. And metanoia means to change your mind, to change your thinking. Mm -hmm. And so whenever you look at repentance in that, in that aspect, in that context, um, and then you go look at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, where Paul talks about be renewed by the transforming of your mind. He's talking about repentance. Yes. And yes. so I don't think anyone would look at Romans 12, 1 and 2 and say that that's a one-time event. I think everyone would look right. at Romans 12, 1 and 2 and say that that's a concurring event. Yes. Well, yep, yep, yep. if that's the case, then repentance is an ongoing event. It's not just yes. a one-time thing. You begin right. your journey with God by repentance, but you also continue with your journey with God by repentance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Very good. All Absolutely. right. So I think we've got that. Uh, I think we'll move on to the witness of the church. There's a lot of good stuff here. Um, oh, yeah. And a lot of fun stuff um, to talk about. I mean, just with the setting, the setting itself is uh, Joseph and Mary bringing Jesus to the temple uh, to be circumcised, right? And to be dedicated to God and, and these these things. Um, and so, Logan, I'll let you um, start it up since that was your, since this is your ball game, and then me and Becky will come on through. Well, um, you know, really the big thing in this passage is the law of God, you mm -hmm. know, uh, if you, you know, I think I mentioned that the, the law of God is mentioned five times all throughout this text. And so if it's, if it's mentioned that many times, then we really need to think about it. God's law is a running theme throughout this passage. And the reason for this is because obedience to the law communicates faithfulness. You know, Mary and Joseph, they, they are not obedient in the same way that I think sometimes we are obedient. I think sometimes we're obedient or we try to be obedient because we're afraid of the wrath of God. We, mm. we, fear, we fear God in an unhealthy way, and so we are afraid of the lightning bolt from the sky. We're afraid of fire from the sky coming down to us, or we're afraid of condemnation. Um, but that's not what it was about for Mary and Joseph, and that's not what it should be about for us either. We should seek to fulfill the law. We should, well, maybe fulfill is not the right word. Jesus fulfilled the law. But we should seek to live after the law of God and use that as a pattern for our lives because that's how God intends for us to live. You, you think, about, think about, first of all, the Ten Commandments. Think about what God tells us to do in the Ten Commandments. Then think about how Jesus basically exposits the Ten Commandments in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the pattern that God wants us to, to use for our life, I think. And, you know, whenever we do that, whenever we try to, to live after that, then we will have, then we'll have blessings. And, and you know, I hate to say that because the word blessing has been so abused by prosperity preachers and teachers, but I think I think we will encounter blessing whenever we try to live after God's heart and the law is God's heart revealed to us. And outside of a relationship with Christ, where we view him as the one who fulfilled the law for us, then we view, then, then the law becomes a weight. It becomes a rock that, that sinks us down into, into the mire and mud. But then when we live in relationship to God through Christ and we understand that Jesus has fulfilled the law on our behalf, then the law becomes a joy. It becomes, you know, the, we, we end up thinking about the commands of God as a joy to live because we understand that God's not out to get us. He's out to give us joy. He's out to give us blessings. He's, uh, you know, he's, he is out for our sanctification, you know, and to so help the way, us be fully human, like to, to experience right. our yes. humanness, our created in the image of God. When you say that, I, I mentioned this before we, we started recording. I had a Bible college professor that talked about freedom in a box. And, and so like, mm -hmm. or basically it was the rules of a game. You can have the most fun in the world when you play a game, as long as everybody's playing by the rules. But once you take away the rules and everybody does what they want, the game is no longer fun. But you brought mm -hmm. up the Ten Commandments specifically. And, and this is where me and my mother, me and my, my mom's a theologian too. She's real big on the Ten Commandments. And I was like, look, the Ten Commandments, they're laws. They're, they're, they're a box. They keep you from going crazy. But you can't mm -hmm. just live by the law because 
you're living by the spirit when you bring up Jesus. So this is one of the things I think about. So in the 10 commandments, it says, don't steal. Now you can do that. But when you're living by the spirit and you're living a full human life, you're not refraining from stealing, but you're also giving. It says, do not mm-hmm. commit murder. You can do mm-hmm. that, but you could also live in such a way that gives life to other people. Right. Yes. Or you yes. can, you know, not only respect your mother and father, but you can have that communion, that on that, that, that Trinity, if you will, that model of the Trinity and communion and fellowship with your parents mm-hmm. and have a holy family in that sense. And so when, when we talk about like the law of God, it's in that respect that when we not only fulfill it, but we go a step further and live by the spirit guided by the law, you, ha- you are deeply human and you're experiencing mm. the full mm. range of humanity when that happens. Mm. I love that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. So, but yeah, you're at, you know, you're right. Uh, God gives us order uh, because that helps us to be fully human. Human flourishing. And that's my key word. I like that. Human, human flourishing. flourishing. Yes. Okay. That's, that's good. Uh, I think I first heard that phrase from Matt Chandler. I heard it from <laughs> Mirasov Volf. So there you go. <laughs> Chandler was reading Volf, I bet. I guarantee Probably you that's so. what it was. <laughs> Probably so. Sorry, um, the, the theology nerds are nerding out over here. Right. <laughs> um, but that's cool. The law... And then, the, and then the other thing that we hit on, which is important for a Reformed church, of which we are part of the Reformed body of, of Christians in this world, is our understanding of how baptism and circumcision are, are, cre- are connected. Our confession of faith does it. It connects it. And so I think it would be good for us to have that conversation on why we baptize babies. And this gives us mm-hmm. a good time to do so. So anyway, I'll open it up to y'all too, and y'all take it from there. Yeah. So basically, whenever we see this story of Jesus being brought into the temple to be circumcised, this is important for us because we need to view circumcision as a precursor to baptism. Mm-hmm. And I don't think we often connect those two events in our minds, but Paul connects those events, actually. Um, and I should have had the scripture marked out uh, somewhere, but he does it in, in Colossians chapter 2, I want to say. Uh, Paul speaks about uh, baptism and circumcision um, in Colossians. And um, let me see. While you're looking for that, I'll just take yeah. a second to say, so different denominations and different Christian theologies understand baptism and the imagery of baptism different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, so like Baptists, for instance, understand baptism as the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and participation in that. Whereas the Reformed Church, the Presbyterians, Lutherans, so on, uh, we would understand baptism as a sign of, the, of, of being, becoming part of the family of God, which would be the right. circumcision. Then you have right. some churches poor, and that image of baptism is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the life of a believer as well. And so depending on where you come from, it, it depends on how you get the image of baptism. But we Cumberland Presbyterians, according to our confession of faith and tradition, uh, we, we understand baptism as a sign and still almost, not exclusively maybe, but pretty close to what they practiced in the Old Testament with circumcision. Right. Uh, there's a video kind of that describes the two main views on baptism called baptism in six minutes and I'll, I'll send that to chris to put in the resources later but it's a really good informative video that points out the main difference between presbyterians and baptists on baptism mm-hmm. and it's just it's just a real short thing uh but no this is the passage i was looking for this is colossians chapter 2 uh, verses 11 and 12 and i'm reading from the christian standard bible uh, Paul says, you were also circumcised. So he's referring to this old Jewish pra- uh, Jewish practice of circumcision, and he's talking to Christian believers. He says, you were also circumcised in him with a circumcision not done with hands by putting off the body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ. When you were buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So when Paul's talking about the circumcision that's not made with hands, um, mm-hmm. he's, he's saying, well, that occurred when you were baptized. Um, so whenever Jesus is being circumcised here, we need to see circumcision as the precursor to baptism. 
because that's how Paul views it. That's how the early church viewed it. Um, I think it's very interesting that in the book of Acts, um, and this is just going to be my honest opinion, I think the Jews would have a hard time accepting the Christian faith if baptism were withheld from infants, because the Jews were a part of a faith that included infants in the covenant. The uh-huh. Jews were a part of a, a, a tradition that included infants in the covenant, and the way, they, the way they saw the sign of God and the sign of seal of God's covenant was through uh-huh. circumcision. So, uh-huh. you know, when you get into the New Testament and Peter starts preaching, he, he says in Acts chapter uh, 2, uh, verse 39, he says, this promise is for you and for your children. For those who are far and, off. And for those who are far off, as as many of our Lord, our God shall call. And we read that passage because we've been infiltrated by Baptist thinking all of our lives. We read that passage and we think, well, that only applies, that applies to my lost children. That applies to my children who haven't accepted the Lord yet. No, that's not how the passage would have been interpreted by the early church. That's not what what Peter meant by that. He said this promise of baptism, baptism. this promise in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. That promise is for your infant children. Yes. That's point blank what he says. And so you get into the New Testament. I, I'm preaching now. I'm sorry. Yeah, you are. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say this. We do have... Uh, a lot of Baptist folks that uh, listen to this and, uh, and actually to use the encounter. And so uh, take this that we're on the same team. <laughs> we are on, you know, we're, we're in the same family. We're in the same, we're on the same team. We just have differences and that's okay. That's right. Um, but, you know, you get into the new Testament and you realize, Oh man, <laughs> this this promise is for my children and we yeah. and we really bring that out in our confession of faith becky is there anything you want to say before i get started again <laughs> <laughs> i will just say understanding that there are a lot of people um especially here in western kentucky maybe that i have talked to more as, as we have conversed before uh, that really still struggle with the idea of baptizing infants and don't understand the purpose behind it. And I think you did a wonderful explanation both in the lesson and today on why it is that it is important for us to understand that as a Cumberland Presbyterian, our belief of infant baptism is that it is a mark of that covenant. You know, that those children that were circumcised, the Jewish children, Jesus himself, That was a mark that he belonged to that nation, to that people. And that is what baptism is for us today. It is a, it is an outward marking that you belong to the family of God. And that's why we baptize our children. And, you know, I think our Baptist brothers and sisters kind of have a problem with that because we have, you know, and even I was raised with this idea because I wasn't raised Cumberland Presbyterian. I was raised, I was raised Pentecostal and Pentecostals share a, view of baptism with Baptists. Um, you know, I, we, we're, we're raised with this idea that you have to claim the faith for yourself. And so wow. baptism is that, baptism is that point at which you claim the faith for yourself and you make the, you make this declaration that you're going to follow Jesus. But the problem with that is um, we have a faith that claims us we, you know, mm-hmm. we don't claim our faith for ourselves. Our faith claims us, you know, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling my, I'm feeling my Calvinist, uh, my inner Calvinist scream irresistible grace here. But, you know, it's, I, I believe that I believe our faith claims us. And I believe mm-hmm. that in baptism, God says, you are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. That's Mm -hmm. God's seal and sign of approval on your life. And it's not because you claim the faith for yourself. It's all because of grace. It's all because God said, you are mine. So there's two things here uh, that I'd I'd, I'd bring up because I think it helps. Um, If you understand baptism as uh, circumcision, reading in the New Testament or the Old Testament, it was not the physical act, as you just said, of circumcision that saved you. It was when you acknowledge that God 
was your savior and you had a circumcision of the heart not done by human hands it's the same way for us in the Cumberland Presbyterian Church or in a Reformed Church. When you're born to a believing parent, a child receives all the benefits of being part of the covenant community, right? And, and right. that includes the sign and seal of being part of the community. But that physical act of baptism doesn't save them. But as they grow up, it is applied to their hearts in the same manner. Mm -hmm. They will make it their own faith in a sense. And then the second thing I just want to point out is that this is kind of fun. In most of the Cumberland Presbyterian areas, it's the Baptists that have influenced Cumberland Presbyterians. But baby dedications done in a Baptist church, there's really no reason for a baby dedication in Baptist theology. But it's the only point in which Reformed theology has influenced the Baptist. So y'all right. can, can put that and say and, we've done something. <laughs> right. And if you want to go even... <laughs> If you want to go even deeper with this idea of being part of the covenant, of you know baptism being the sign and seal of the covenant for for believe or for you know infants and the and their and their believing parents, then you can look at the warning passages in the book of Hebrews. Uh, those warning passages are to people who are under the covenant who have received the sign and seal of the covenant of baptism, uh, but they haven't fully they haven't fully surrendered to Jesus. And, and basically the writer of Hebrews says that if you've received the sign and seal of the covenant and you don't repent and believe and you don't follow Jesus, then you're under greater judgment because you've accepted the sign and seal of the covenant in vain. Right. And I'll say this too. So, so far as us theology nerds, if you're out there listening, if you're not a theology nerd, just cut your ears for a second. But um, we do have a concept in the Reformed Church of the visible and invisible church. So also in a sense that you're, you're, you're a part of the visible church and you receive all the benefits, but the invisible church is those whose heart is right toward God. Or it's when Paul says, not everyone who is Israel is actually Israel kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, all right. Well, we've, we haven't got off on a rabbit trail. It was a good trail. It's the right trail. It, it um, was a good trail. So do we need to, anything else in there or do we need to go through the application of the, of the text? Hearing you quote Romans 9 made me happy. Yeah, right. That's that inner cow <laughs> in you coming up. Um, if that's the case, I think I'm going to push on through to the uh, applying the scripture, sharing insights in the covenant community section. And then, uh, Logan, I think you got this right. And I'm going to let you start. And, and the way these common themes that you talk about, that worship, waiting, and rest. Mm -hmm. so go ahead. And... Yeah, as you look at the text here in, in Luke chapter two there's three common themes i think you'll find uh very strongly that's emphasized here and that's the concept of of worship the concept of of waiting you know waiting on god and the concept of wrestling so you know there's this there's this idea that there's worship going on in the temple um the people are you know mary and joseph are taking jesus in there as, to worship and because you know and because they want to dedicate their son and um, so there worship, there's wor the worship of God is going on. Then there's waiting mm -hmm. on God. You see that with Anna and you see that with Simeon and there's wrestling with God. And you see that specifically in the life of Anna. And, um, you know, through Mary, I think I say through in the lesson through Mary and Joseph, you see the value of worshiping God and what it means to, to raise your children so that they will grow up and worship the Lord. Um, you know, Actually, I said it here too. Many times, well-intentioned Christians will say that they want their children to have their own faith. However, God's intention is for his people to share the same faith. Mm -hmm. So um, we shouldn't seek to have our own faith. Instead, we should seek to have uh, in, instead we should seek to have our own claim on the common faith that Christians have shared for the last two millennia. Mm -hmm. And then you look at the life of Simeon. Simeon was Simeon is waiting on God. He had been promised uh, that he would see the consolation of Israel. And then you see the prophetess Anna. She is wrestling with God. Um, perhaps she doesn't know why or, or how or why that she's wrestling with God, but, but she is. And we see her in the temple. She's praying all night and all day. And we know based on the fact that the Bible also says that she's a widow that she's encountered, and she's been a widow for a very long time. She's encountered mm -hmm. an incredible amount of suffering in her life. And so I think we can look over the course of our own lives and see that we've also probably encountered an incredible amount of suffering. 
and and we have to figure out how that fits into our wrestling with God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Becky, what you got there? Uh, you know, I really was just thinking about that worshiping God because another thing that you really touched on in this lesson is the community of faith. Uh, we talked about it with the baptism that, um, you know, even as an infant baptism, it is that is that covenant marking that they're part of this family of faith. And, and one thing that I think that we struggle with in the Western culture is we don't necessarily practice our faith outside of Sunday morning services. Um, and that is something that in the Jewish culture that was very common. You know, we're talking about the Shabbat and, and just all the different rituals and things that they did in the Jewish culture, how each one of those things reminded them continuously of who they were and to who they belonged. Um, And here in our Western culture, it's, well, I belong to this church. Well, okay, that's, that's where you go. And that's awesome. And I'm, and, and I want you to really pour into that community, but then you need to understand that your community, your church family is a whole lot bigger than just that that one building and we have lost a lot of the rituals um you know we talked about it i think before we started recording that our entire calendar revolves around uh, the life of jesus uh christmas easter you know we kind of have this whole church calendar that revolves around his life and in our culture we seem to kind of have gotten away from that uh, where we're not worshiping daily And that's so important for us as we develop our faith, as we develop our community of faith, um, that we continue worshiping as we wrestle and wait for his return. And I think that's part of the wrestling, for sure. I mean, you know, like that's part of the wrestling is that um, trying to, I mean, you know, we have our, you know, I believe Lord help my unbelief. I mean, like, we, yes, you need to be intentional about how, how we think about faith outside of Sunday morning mm-hmm. and begin some practices that develop that. And it's wrestling. I mean, if you're trying to pray for 25, 30 minutes after about two or three, if you ain't careful, it's <laughs> wrestling. Like, yep. Yeah, like, I mean, it is. exactly. And you got to learn how to do that. And there's different ways. And I think, Becky, also what you were saying is the ancient church and the church from all times and all places until about the last, you know, 60 years, you did right. have rituals that helped yes. you to wrestle. I remember. Maybe mm-hmm. is a good term with it. I mean, it helped you wrestle. And so, and I hope we can bring some of those back. I, I think we have to. We have no anchors in our society. It feels like there's nothing that anchors us. And, and, right, yes. and you know, say what you want to about, you know, liturgies or things like that. Man, uh, they're anchors. They're, they're mm-hmm. places of familiarity in an unknown world. And the deeper they go, the, the more confident you can be to live in a world. And so they can't become idols but they are i think they do help us wrestle in that sure way. um you know whenever i sit down to pray you know i have to keep myself focused and and the way i keep myself focused is i have three books in front of me when i'm praying i've got my bible i've got the book of common prayer Neil and, is kind. I've, <laughs> and i've got this book the valley of vision um and this is a book of puritan prayers and so what I will do is I will sit there and I will find a psalm in my Bible. I'll read the psalm. As I'm reading the psalm, I'm thinking about what God is saying in the psalm. And I will try mm-hmm. to pray that. Okay, let me, I'm going to write down this resource. Have you ever, I cannot remember the guy's name, but I use it. I, I, I learned it in Bible college. You pray the psalms. Just go verse by verse and just pray a mm-hmm. psalm. And before mm-hmm. you know it, an hour's over. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I'm look so as I'm as I'm looking at this psalm, whatever it is, because because the, the psalm, the reason I specifically use the psalms is because the psalms are are both the prayer, they were both the prayer book and the hymn book of the early church, mm-hmm. right? We yes. you know we we go to church every Sunday and we have two books that we mostly use. We've got our we've got our King James Bible and we've got our Heavenly Highway Hymnal, and we think the Heavenly Highway Hymnal is just as infallible as that King James Bible. But it's not. But the psalm, but the early church had a much better hymnal, and it was the Psalms. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, 
I use the Psalms because that was the hymnal and that was the prayer book of the early church. And I use the Book of Common Prayer to aid me in that. And I also use the prayers from the Valley of Vision to kind of to kind of hold those things up and kind of uh, focus myself on what it is I want to say to God. And in, in, and in, in doing all of all three of those things, I will lift up my personal concerns and pray for others around, around me while I'm doing that. So it's not like I'm just following a script. I'm using those things to help me stay focused. Right. Right. I'll put in some resource links for daily prayers because I use a daily prayer. You know, my, my morning starts is one thing I ask the Lord, this only do I seek that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, you know, these kinds of things. Um, and, and it, and people could say it's rote, but it's also like, a it's a voice calling you back home, you know, I yeah. mean, when you do so. It's a comfort. It's a comfort. You know, it's the same with saying the Lord's prayer, you know, that's, that's a comfort. That is something that focuses all. And, and one of the imageries that I don't remember which professor um, said this, I'm gonna have to think about this, but when we say the Lord's prayer, it's connecting us to everyone who has ever said the Lord's prayer all the way back, you know, and what a beautiful image of, again, that family of faith, that with this thing that we're saying that it's connecting us to all these voices and all these different languages all the way back that we're, we're offering this before the throne of God together as one body. Um, any parting shots? Because we've been on here our allotted time, I believe. <laughs> Which I guess is kind of my call, but I'm trying to keep it under now for sure. No, you're good. I just, <laughs> I, I really, again, Logan, I really love the theme of the worship, the wrestling and the waiting that you have put through this whole lesson. And I hope people really kind of take heart in that to understand that they're not alone in this. And if you're listening today, you're not alone in wrestling with God. We all have something that we're wrestling with and just know that we all wrestle together as a family. Yes. Logan, parting shot. Um, you know, read the text and think about what God is saying. You know, think about how, think about the ways that you wrestle with God. Think about the ways that people in your Sunday school class might wrestle with God. And if you can try to speak to that, uh, because, you know, we're, like I said earlier, all, all of our wrestling looks, looks different. And so you're going to be able to speak to your congregation in a way that we can't. Amen. Um, so. um, all right. So then we're going to depart. You've, like I said, had Christmas and everything's great. The next time we get together, we're going to pretend like it's January 3rd, and uh, that'll be the fifth lesson. That's actually January is mine in this quarter, and so we're going to talk about wisdom from above, Uh, but until then, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you, and um, thank you all for all that you do, and for anybody that's listening to this, encounter at cumberland.org if you want to send any questions, comments, or snide remarks, or the Facebook pages. There's a bunch of them out there. Call me, 615-424-8561, and um, just let me know. I look forward to hearing from everyone. So thank you guys very much. Amen. Amen.